focus on. We're not focused on that like the religions of men that you see on television, which that seems like that's pretty much all they talk about. There is from time to time a need to talk about giving. This is June 1st. 2012 is half, well, excuse me, July 1st. I'm a month behind. See, I don't even know what month it is. This is July 1st. The, the year is half over. 2012 is half finished. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about giving. I'm going to issue a challenge about our giving and talk about the state of affairs within the congregation here at Roy City. Uh, you know the president from time to time will give a State of the Union address in which he will talk about the state of the country and talk about some of the things that the nation is facing. Well, we're going to talk about the, the state of the congregation when it comes to finances and how that this ties in with our lesson of giving. God wants His people to give. He wants His religion to be financed. Exodus chapter 36. Let's look at a passage that I think reflects the type of attitude and the type of zeal that God wants from His people when it comes to giving. Exodus chapter 36, verses 2 through 7, you have the construction of the sanctuary that God has given a pattern for, and He instructs the people to give so that the sanctuary can be financed and be built. And it says in verse 2, Then Moses and Belza and Ahalib, and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So their heart is stirred to build the sanctuary, the tabernacle that God wanted built. Verse uh, 3 also says, So they continued to bring to him free will offerings every morning. Verse 4. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary, each came, each from the work he was doing. And they spoke to Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. They're bringing much more than enough. Verse 6. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. For the people were restrained from bringing. Why? Verse 7. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. Now think about that. Here is a good situation in Israel. They are so excited about the Lord's work. Their heart is stirred in doing the Lord's work that they start bringing free will offerings to the point where Moses is told there's too much. We have too much now. We have too much money. We have too much material. And so Moses actually has to give a command to the people and say, you're giving too much. He had to restrain the people from giving because they were so zealous in their giving. They were giving much more than enough. So a command went out to the camp saying, it needs to come to an end. Here's the reason why, verse 7. Exodus chapter 36 and verse 7. For the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. Now that's zeal. That's excitement. That is a passion for the work of the Lord so much so they had so much material, so much money as it were that a command had to go forth and say, stop giving. Stop giving, there's too much. That's the beginning of the nation of Israel. Towards the end of Israel's history, you have Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, our scripture reading. Malachi 3 verses 8 through 10. God, through the prophet Malachi, is talking about the problem that the nation is facing. He says to Judah, Will a man rob God? Verse 8. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. 
you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me in this, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Notice the different attitude of the people here towards the end of Old Testament history. Now he's saying to them, you've robbed me. In Exodus chapter 36, the commandment had to go out and say, you're giving too much. We have more than enough. You need to stop giving. We have more than enough for the sanctuary. They had a good, zealous attitude towards things. In Malachi chapter 3, God through the prophet said, you're robbing me. Now how can you rob God? And he says, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings. You're not giving as you should, he's saying to his people. He says, you're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me. When we withhold from God what he deserves, what is due him, we are robbing God. Whether it's robbing God of the glory that he deserves through our obedience or whether it's robbing God financially, not giving as we ought upon the first day of the week. And we'll have more to say about that a little bit later on. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. The whole nation was guilty of robbing God. They were spiritual criminals because they weren't giving as they should. But he issues them a challenge. Notice this challenge he issues them. He says, bring in the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This isn't because God needs it. It's because He knows when that's there, it's going to be a blessing to His people. He says, try me now in this. Some translations might say, test me in this. Test me in this. When you bring from a sincere heart the tithes and offerings, test me in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven... And pour out for you such a blessing that there will be not be room enough to receive it. I will bless you if you are obedient and give sacrificially to me. That blessing, of course, is spiritual, but it's also physical as well. It's physical as well. He's talking about physical things here. And he says, if you stop robbing me, if you stop being these spiritual criminals then I am going to bless you. And you put me to the test in this and see if it happens. He says, I'll open the windows of heaven. That's an expression that means I've got so much blessing for you, I'm just going to open up a portal of heaven and it's just going to rain down upon you. Such blessing. It's going to pour down on you. But that comes when the people were willing to stop robbing God and to give Him what He deserves from a sincere heart. We need to have the attitude of Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Here's the result. So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The wise man here, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying here, you honor God and you bless Him, He'll take care of you. You'll be taken care of. And we need to put God to the test. He says, test me. Try me in this and see if this is going to happen. Put me to the test and see if I won't bless you. And therefore, we honor God with our possessions, what we have, with the first fruits of all of your increase. Giving to the Lord the first fruits, the best. Under the Old Testament, it was the best of the flock. There were certain requirements you read in the book of Leviticus concerning the sacrifice. You couldn't give what was sick and what was lame. That's what they were doing in Malachi. In fact, in Malachi, he says, you give the sick and the lame to your governor and see if he'll accept that. He said, but that's what you're doing to me. You're giving me the sick and the lame and and that which is left over, that which you can do without. If you can do without it, it's not a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. So here we have God saying through Solomon, 
You, ble- you uh, honor me with your possessions, what you have. You give the first fruits of all your increase. And if you do, you'll be taken care of. Your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. The New Testament calls this a sacrifice. Our giving upon the first day of the week, our financial contribution in which we finance the work of the church is called a sacrifice. Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. Paul talking to the Philippian brethren, he says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Notice that. For Paul's necessities. Not all of Paul's desires, his necessities. You sent once and again for my aid for my necessities. Verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. He's saying, I'm not seeking this materially, but I know that if you give and you give sacrificially, that is going to be something that is a fruit in your account. That's going to benefit you spiritually. Why? Because Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's why. That's why it's a blessing on our account to give and to give sacrificially to the work of the Lord. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And that's what Paul is saying here in Philippians 4 and verse 17. I'm not seeking the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Verse 18. Here you have true contentment. Verse 18, Philippians 4. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. That financial gift that you sent by the hand of Epaphroditus, he says that is a sacrifice. It's a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice that's well-pleasing to God. Then he says in verse 19, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. As one preacher said, God has plenty of money. God has plenty of money. He's going to take care of His people. And so we need to trust that. As as He said, try me. Put me to the test and see if this will happen. So... As we consider this and we consider our giving, I want you to consider also in the privilege of giving, I want you to think about this. The privilege of giving, 10%. The 10% principle. Now hear me out before you draw conclusions in your own mind, in your own heart. Under the patriarchal period and Mosaic period, you had 10% giving. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 in the New Testament is talking about a historical event that took place in the book of Genesis when Abraham met Melchizedek. And notice what the Hebrews writer is saying about Abraham and mentions it twice in Hebrews chapter 7. He says in verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. And in verse 4, he mentions that again, giving a tenth part of all of the spoils of battle. This is mentioned in the Genesis account of this event, and it's mentioned here that you have Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people, paying a 10% of the spoils, giving, donating a 10% of the spoils, to this priest of God, Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. And so you have the principle of 10% giving in the patriarchal period. When you come to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 29, we're not going to take the time to read all of that, but you see again the principle of the tenth. 
10% giving under the law of Moses. So the law of Moses talks about giving a tenth or a tithe, 10% of what you possess to the Lord. And that's what Malachi was talking about when the people weren't doing that. Malachi said, you're robbing God. God was saying through Malachi, you're robbing me. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about it. Would God want His people to give less today? If under the patriarchy, God blessed a man for giving 10% of his possessions. Under the law of Moses, God specifically commanded a tenth, a tithe. Under the New Testament, I realize there is not a command in the 27 books of the New Testament for us to give 10%. We are to give as we increase. We are to give as we are blessed. We are to give as we prosper. But can we logically conclude that we could give less now? The book of Hebrews tells us that we live under a new and better covenant based upon better promises. Now, if you conclude in your heart, well, I believe that 1% is what I'm going to give to the Lord. Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If that's what you decide, then that's, that's what you're going to have to take to judgment. As far as me and my family, we have decided a long time ago that we're going to give 10% and sometimes more. And God has blessed us. God has blessed us. He's taken care of us. We have no complaints. We have been abundantly blessed by the brethren here and brethren in other places. It can be done. It can be done. I'm not saying, please understand, and I want this to go on record, I'm not saying in the New Testament we are commanded to give a tithe. The word tithe in connection with our giving is nowhere found in the New Testament concerning the New Testament church. I'm not saying that at all. If you're happy with giving... Half a percent, one percent, five percent. Again, you've got to work out your own salvation. But there's a principle, as we've seen all throughout the Bible, and we've only touched on a few scriptures. In the patriarchal period, 10 percent. In the Mosaic period, 10 percent. In the Christian age, in my estimation of things, no less than 10 percent, I think, would be something that's sacrificial to the Lord. But if you disagree and if you want to do something more, that's between you and God. But the fact of the matter is, it's a sacrifice. What we give is a sacrifice. And even if we're on a fixed income, we definitely can give. Luke chapter 21 verses 1 through 4 proves that. You have the widow lady giving, and Jesus commends this widow lady for giving. And says she gave all that she had. She gave sacrificially. And she gave more than all of those rich people who were giving. Because she gave out of her poverty sacrificially. Some people say, well I'm on a fixed income. I can't give. Luke chapter 21 verses 1 through 4 dispels that. If you increase any in your life. If you you prosper any in your life. You can give part of that to the Lord. Because that is prospering. That is prospering. Here's a woman that's definitely on a fixed income. She was able to give. She was able to give sacrificially. And the Lord took care of her. And commended her and gave her as an example of giving. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We need to give sacrificially and we need to give consistently. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1 and 2. There's a reason why there's weekly giving in the church. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. Verse 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Some translations say on the first day of every week. In fact, that's more accurate. The Greek there is saying on the first day of every week you do this. You lay by in store. You give as you have prospered. Weekly contribution to the Lord's cause. 
Why upon the first day of every week? Because Acts 20 and verse 7. That's when the Lord's church gathered together to worship, to break bread, the Lord's Supper. And so it's only logical that upon that time when God's people gathered together upon the first day of the week, that they prepare beforehand to give and to have a financial contribution to finance the work of God's people. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, we don't have time to go into those, but I would urge you to study these chapters concerning the attitude and the disposition of heart by which we must have if we're going to give, if our giving is going to be sacrificial, and if our giving is going to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He gives the examples of the Macedonians who in deep poverty gave liberally. They were in deep poverty, but they gave liberally. Why? They first gave themselves to the Lord. They were dedicated themselves to the Lord. They gave themselves to the cause of Christ. They were doing exactly what what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, offering themselves up as a living sacrifice. And therefore, naturally, their giving was liberal. And they were financing the work of the Lord. And these poor saints in Macedonia were being held up by the Apostle Paul as examples of giving. We're to give bountifully, liberally. God loves a cheerful giver. You know what a cheerful giver is? It's someone who is glad and happy to give, to give liberally. They don't dread to see the plate pass their way. They're happy to give because they know it's going for a greater cause and based upon the fact it's going to their account. I'm not talking about buying your way into heaven, but the Bible does say this fruit, as Paul told the Philippians, is on your account. We want you to bear this fruit on your account. God takes note of what you're doing when we give, and we give sacrificially to the cause of Christ. And the greatest motivation of all for our giving, to give consistently, to give sacrificially, is because God is the great giver. First Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15. In the context of talking about giving, he says, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. God so loved the world that He gave. He gave. God is a giver. He's given us life. He's given us spiritual life in Christ Jesus. He's given us all blessings that are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. He has given us a blessed nation. The freedoms that we have this morning to do what we're doing, many Christians throughout the world don't have. We need to be thankful for it and pray that it maintains itself in the midst of a nation that's going astray. We are so very blessed, most of all, to have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, Let's look at the state of affairs here in this congregation. The Portland Church supports us with $500 a month. Every month. Starting in January is when that started. Because we suffered losses, we suffered financial setbacks as well. And I appealed to good brethren around the area. Some gave one-time donations to help us out financially. The church in Portland, where I go to the lectureship every once in a while and speak, they are the ones that have consistently said for the next year of 2012, every month we're going to give you $500 to help the congregation get back on its feet. There's a good Christian man in Grand Prairie, an individual Christian who supports us with $40 a week to help out this congregation out of his own pocket. There have been other individuals who have given, who are not members of this congregation, to help us out. All of that will come to an end in December. This outside help is going to come to an end in December. My salary as the evangelist is $900 a week. And so when we give, what you see the offering up there, 
you subtract $900 from it. So you see the problem that we face from time to time. When you see that number on the offering spike up to $1,400, $1,500, that's when we get that check in. That's when we get that help. That $40 a week is sometimes given in a one lump sum at the first of the month. And that $500 is usually given at the first of the month to help out the church financially. And that is something that I'm very appreciative of. I tell those brethren uh, that I appreciate it. I write a thank you letter every month to the eldership in the Portland Church of Christ thanking them for supporting us. They are like-minded brethren with us. And however, um, they have bigger numbers than uh, we do. And uh, they're able to help us out financially. And so we uh, appreciate that uh, so very, very much. And so we see that we have some growing to do in this area. I know we're smaller in number, but I I want to issue uh, this challenge. A six-month challenge for the financial well-being of this congregation. Let us purpose to give at least 10% of our gross income. Off the top. So we're going to give this to the Lord at least. Now if you're doing that, that's great. If you want to give more, that's fantastic. The, the fact of the matter is, I'm not doing this to ask for a raise. I'm not expecting to get a raise. I've been making the same amount of salary for several years. I'm not seeking that. We're seeking for this church to maintain itself and to be financially independent by the end of the year. In other words, we can take care of our own financial needs in this congregation without any outside help. Because not only do you have to pay the preacher and support his family, you've got to pay the light bill. You've got to pay for the water. And we are trying to get this church to grow biblically. God gives the increase. We invite people. We don't entice them with entertainment. We don't offer them any giveaways. We invite people to come hear about Jesus and come be a part of a New Testament church that is serious about living the Christian life. We're not playing church. I think many people realize that. And therefore, we're not going to use any of the money for entertainment purposes. This isn't to buy toys for my children. This isn't to pay for ski trips or trips to Six Flags. This is for the work of the church. And when you study the Bible, the work of the church is like the word be. Benevolence, edification, and evangelism. And that's what the money is used for. And to maintain this facility here. We're not trying to get rich. We're trying to maintain this congregation that it might be a congregation that glorifies the Lord and stands for what is right because in this area where we are, that's becoming an endangered species. And we need to be strong. But as the preacher said, as I mentioned earlier, the Lord has plenty of money. But He uses God's people to finance His religion. And it is His religion. So I want us to have this challenge at heart as we think about our our giving so that by December we can say to uh, those who are financially supporting us, thank you, we appreciate what you've done for for us in 2012. Now we are standing on our own two feet starting in 2013 as we serve the Lord and do His will. Remember, the motivation for our giving is God's indescribable gift. If you believe in Jesus with all your heart, He is the Son of God. You make that great confession with your mouth and you're willing to repent of all your sins, turn away from that. You're ready for baptism. You're ready to be immersed in water. Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, tonight we're going to have a sermon on Acts chapter 2. Be reading Acts chapter 2 for tonight's sermon. Be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are a child of God, you've done that already. You've obeyed the plan of salvation, but you're not faithful to the Lord. 
We urge you to consider your life, repent, and come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While together we stand and we sing.